welcome to or welcome back to my channel. I'm Laura and today we're going to be talking about how to tackle programming questions. I alluded to this video a little bit last week when I talked about how to answer any interview question and so I wanted to make sure I got this video out as soon as possible after that one. Without beating around the bush, the technical or programming question is going to be the most important part of the interview process for you. Whether you're interviewing for a software engineering role or a product management role that may like you to be more technical and know how to code, your interviewers will love it because you'll be incredibly clear in how you're answering the problem and making sure that you're doing it correctly, and you'll also be glad because you won't be failing as many interviews anymore in the future. I would like to note first that this method is recommended by Gail McDowell, the author of Cracking the Coding Interview and Cracking the PM Interview, which are two very popular interview prep books, so I do not claim to take any credit about the origins of the framework. I have added extra notes or guidelines, however, based off of my experiences and other resources that I've used or read in the past. For the purpose of this video, let's pretend that you have one single problem and you also have 30 minutes to solve it. So here's a quick overview of what the framework looks like. Step one is to read or listen to the problem that you've been given. Step two is to create any test cases to help clarify your understanding and to walk through the problem. Step three is to create a brute force algorithm for the problem. Step four is to work to optimize that brute force solution. Step five is to then walk through your optimized solution and maybe run a test case through it too. Step six is to finally implement your code. And step seven is to run through all the test cases with your written code to make sure that they all work. Step one, read or listen to the problem that you've been assigned. This can sound a little bit obvious, but a lot of people that I know and when I was first starting out doing interviews really just immediately jump to the problem and try to solve it. There can be a lot of misunderstandings that arise between you getting the problem and you actually solving the problem. Taking a minute to clarify any questions you have about the problem can save you many more minutes of headache and pain later on down the road. Another reason why it's important to actually read carefully into the problem is because there are often keywords in the problem that can help simplify your life and clue you into what the optimal solution should look like. So for example, when I'm working with an array or an array-based problem, one important keyword would be if the array is sorted or not sorted. If the array is sorted, then that gives you a hint. Maybe the problem can be solved in, say, O of log n time to use binary search, or a special condition related to binary search to help solve your problem. An optional part of the step is to help outline how you'll be explaining your solution. In essence, you'll just be repeating back the framework to your interviewer, saying, this is how I'm going to solve my problem. Does that sound good? And they, of course, will say yes, and you're free to move on to the next step. So step number two, create and outline as many test cases as you can that seem feasible and also test the range of inputs that your problem is asking for. So when you're creating test cases, it's really important to cover every single case possible. Because it's a time interview, you aren't expected to say cover every single possible edge case and every single possible normal case. You should have a nice distribution of one or two test cases that obviously make sense for the problem, one or two cases that may be edge cases resulting in unexpected or unusual behavior if your program does not handle them correctly, and if necessary, even one or two bad inputs to clarify if your program should handle these bad inputs or not. You can usually run these by your interviewer to get a feel for what they think. In fact, I would highly recommend doing that too. It's really important to help bring up test cases early on because it shows that you're thinking beyond just solving the problem. You're actually thinking into what goes into the function and what will come out of the function. Thank you, construction. So some results that can lead to erratic behavior can include negative inputs, inputs that are way too small, inputs that are way too big, duplicated numbers, non-sorted input, etc. A quick note about coming up with regular test cases, you want to make sure that your regular test cases are big enough. You don't want such a small input, for example, that it doesn't actually test the full range of your program. You also don't want too large of an input because then it can be difficult to test by hand. So step number three come up with a brute force solution to the problem. So here's where a lot of interviewees make a common mistake. They jump from asking questions about the problem to immediately trying to write up code and solve the problem. This can lead to a lot of erroneous code being written during the interview, and it may also just demonstrate poor planning and foresight on your end. In coming up with a brute force solution, you can basically forget everything you know about the problem and just think about the dumbest, most straightforward approach to solving the problem at hand. So the reason why coming up with a brute force solution first is really crucial is so that at least if you don't make other headway on the problem, you have the solution to fall back on and you can refer to when you're walking through your test cases at the very end. Coming up with a brute force solution also puts you in a good spot in terms of figuring out what your next steps are and how you can move forward with your program. Again, I want to stress that we're not trying to impress the interviewer and say that we can instantly solve the problem. We really want to show the interviewer that we're capable of thinking through our problem and working iteratively. So once you're done coming up with the brute force solution, this should not be coded at all. So I repeat, there should be zero code being written so far at this point. With your brute force solution, this should be either communicated via text, on a Word document of some sort, 
or just through comments on whatever IDE or programming environment you may be using. It might also be a good idea to talk about the space and time complexity of your solution to demonstrate that you're actually thinking about these different constraints with your problem moving forward. Step number four optimize your brute force solution. So this step should be taking the longest out of all of the steps in this framework. Now that you have your brute force solution down, you can take some time to actually optimize your solution and think about why your brute force solution may be so slow. Here are some key tips on how you can optimize your solution. An important step here is to think about what the best possible runtime could ever be. If your problem involves sorting of any kind, then your best possible runtime is only ever going to be O of n log n. So when you're moving from your brute force solution to your optimized solution, keep in mind that you can't do any better than that. On the other hand, if your problem involves searching of any kind and your array is sorted, then you know that the best possible runtime is O of log n using some sort of binary search. Next, Gale recommends using this system or acronym called BUD, which stands for bottlenecks, unnecessary work, and duplicated code. All of these are pretty self-explanatory, so I'll go into just a brief explanation of what each of these mean. So bottlenecks refer to a part of your algorithm that may be necessary, but slow and cumbersome. So this can include something like sorting. Is there a way to get rid of sorting in our solution to help optimize the runtime even further? Example of removing a bottleneck is when we're looking at a problem to find all duplicates in an array. One approach is to first sort the array, which creates a bottleneck, and then go back through from the beginning of the array to find any duplicates in the array. A second approach, however, is to just use a set. So we can pass through the array only one time, and as we move through the array, keep track of all other elements that we've seen before. Once you've already seen that element in the array, then we can count a duplicate. So U stands for unnecessary work. Is there anything that you're doing in your solution that isn't actually necessary to help you solve the problem? This really just means, is there anything in your solution that you're doing that isn't actually necessary? Usually this means that you can look at the problem, see if there's any information that isn't actually necessary to help you solve the problem. Lastly is duplicated work. Is there any part in your solution that you're doing essentially the same thing? Commonly, this will mean calculating values that you've already calculated before. So duplicated work will come up as a next step for many dynamic programming problems because dynamic programming helps you get rid of repetitive value calculations. Besides BUD, another step here is to think about any algorithms or data structures that you already know that can help simplify your work here. For example, when we were talking about BUD, I mentioned how a set can be helpful to cut down on bottlenecks. Asking yourself explicitly, are there any other resources that I can fall back on to help make my solution a bit easier? Finally, if you really have no idea how to optimize your code beyond the brute force solution, ask your interviewer if they can provide you with a hint. At least they can give you some clues on if you're moving in the right direction. Step 5. So once you have the optimized solution, let's actually walk through your program and what it does. Number five here is a great way to recap basically the first half of the interview that you've now completed. You want to walk through your algorithm, make sure that it's easy to understand, and that it catches all the corner cases that you previously mentioned earlier in the interview. Be sure to take your time here and do not rush the explanation. Truly show that you understand what is going on with your solution and how you can handle particular inputs, such as the test cases that you put forward in step two. Your interviewer will often ask you any follow-up questions, clarifications, etc. that they may have missed while walking through your solution. Now, the most important part, check in with your interviewer right now to see if you're okay to start coding. If you have the correct solution and your interviewer thinks it looks good, they'll go ahead and let you start. However, there may be some glaring issues in your algorithm that your interviewer may ask you to clarify before you actually get started. Again, this is just to help save you time and headaches later down the road. Instead of spending time fixing your code and also trying to fix your algorithm, here you only have to spend time fixing your algorithm and not your code. All right, so step six. Implement your code. This is arguably the most exciting part of the interview where you actually have to translate your algorithm into real functioning code. Hopefully at this point, you have a good grasp of what the problem is asking and what your interviewer is expecting based off of the previous steps that you've completed. So while I can't guide you too much in this particular area, there are a few general tips that I can provide. Make sure you avoid obvious pitfalls such as beginning code or mistakes. This can include using a single equal sign instead of a double equal sign, creating variables incorrectly, basically anything that may hint you actually don't have full control control or grasp of what your language is doing. The second tip here is to write good, clean looking code. Your interview is also a reflection of how you genuinely write code on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether you like it or not, your interview will also serve as a reflection of how you work. If you write sloppy code in your interview, you may be prone to writing sloppy code outside of the interview too. 
It may be also helpful to follow standard naming conventions for your variables and functions, just Pascal case or snake case, but this won't be a huge issue. Lastly, a way that you can help save time here is to ask your interviewer if you can assume that a function exists before you actually have to write it. So this can be another helper function, such as a depth first search helper function, or whatever it may be for your particular problem. This may save some time though, so you don't have to go back and forth between two different functions. Step number seven, test your code with the test cases that you've created from step number two. This step will vary a little bit based on how you're actually conducting your interview. If your interview is entirely virtual, aka through a platform like CoderPad, then you'll most likely already have a series of automated tests for you to run. Alternatively, your interviewer may have you write those test cases and then automatically run them against your solution. In these cases, you won't have as much to walk through. If anything doesn't pass your solution, go through your code and explain it or identify where and why your code is failing. If you have time, of course, you'd want to go back and also fix your solution and then rerun those tests until they work. On the other hand, if you don't have automated tests, so you're either working by hand, on a whiteboard, in an in-person interview, make sure you go through each of your different test cases that cover normal inputs, edge inputs, and if requested, bad inputs as well. This will help to show that you truly understand what your solution is doing and how it's doing it. Before we wrap up this video, I also want to touch upon a few common mistakes that I've made in the past and that I'm sure other job interviewees have made as well. This first mistake is one that I did all the time, relying too much on pseudocode and never actually jumping to code. So because I wasn't as confident in my coding abilities, I wanted to stick to pseudocode to help explain all of my solutions. Demonstrated that I knew how to solve the problem. I didn't actually demonstrate any of my ability to program, which is obviously a very important part of being a software engineer. The next common mistake is coding before getting sign off from your interviewer. Oftentimes, the most important part of checking in with your interviewer is to make sure you don't have any glaring flaws in your algorithm or solution before you implement it. If you start coding before your interviewer checks you off, you may just be letting a crucial error or a bug slip through in your algorithm that can lead to greater headaches later on. So the third mistake is not communicating communicating or explaining anything of what you're doing. Hopefully by just following this framework, you won't fall into this trap, but many interviewees just jump around in their solutions or don't communicate what they're doing at all. I would highly recommend also just practicing this point with a friend or family member, just to make sure you're able to communicate your thoughts while also doing something else on the side, such as programming. Finally, remember for most of these questions that they're asking us students, they're really only expecting 15 to 35 lines of code at max. Don't freak out. All of this interview or recommended framework, you'll be good to go. To recap, this is a pretty simple seven step method. Make sure that you can walk through any problem regardless of how difficult it is. By following this framework, you'll be able to stand out against other candidates who may not be as prepared. Also be able to demonstrate the ever-loved skill of communication, and I promise you the interviewers will love you for it. I'd also love to hear how this framework has helped you, so if you used it and you found it helpful, please leave a comment down below. If you love this video and want to see similar content, please like this video and subscribe to this channel for weekly uploads at 9am Fridays about tech, career, and lifestyle. That's all I have for this video. Catch you next week. Bye!